Welcome to this presentation on quantum ciphertext indistinguishability, recoverability and OAEP. My name is Patrick Struck, I'm from University of Regensburg and this is joint work with Juliane Kremer, also from University of Regensburg. Let's start with the setting. So we consider quantum security, so here we can generally distinguish between different levels of securities. So we have classical security, where both the adversary and the users only have classical computing power, meaning in this case, the adversary only gets classical access to oracles. Then we have the common setting of post-quantum security, where our adversary has quantum computing power, while the users still have classical computing power. And in this case, the adversary gets quantum access to the offline oracles, for instance, like random oracles, where uh, access to online oracles is still classical, so everything that is provided by the users that require, for instance, things that require some key. And then we also have quantum security, where we now also assume that the users have quantum computing power, and here the adversary is able to both access, quantumly access the offline oracles as well as the online oracles. And this gives a hierarchy from weak to strong, so quantum security achieves the strongest security guarantees and is also the scope of uh, this work here. So and when we consider quantum security notions for public key encryption, we have mainly three different security notions. There's the first one by Bonnet and Zentry from 2013, the interqCCA CCA security notion. And here we have classical challenges for the adversary, but the adversary gets quantum access to a decryption oracle. And this notion is of the left or right form, so distinguishing between encrypting the left message or the right message, and it is always applicable. Then we have the Q and QCPA security notion by Chevalier, Ibrahimi and Wu from 2020. Here we get quantum challenges for the adversary, and the notion is of the form real or random, and also always applicable. Finally, we have the Q and QCPA security notion that we developed in previous work. Here we also have quantum challenges and it's of the form left or right, but this notion is not always applicable. And this also, the applicability of this notion defines the scope of this work now. Before we start, let's, let's catch up on some background and first starting with the quantum operators. Here you can see like the, the default operator we usually have, so we have uh, two input registers here, x and y, and then an operator for some function f, or the xor operator for some function f, maps this to x and then xors the function f of x into the output register. So this is what we call the xor operator, and we know that this operator is realizable for any function f, and in particular it creates entanglement between the two registers. There's another kind of operator, which only takes here x as input and directly transforms this into f of x. And this is what we call an in-place operator, which were first, men first mentioned by Kashevi et al. in 2002. And here this operator is only realizable for functions that are reversible. And in particular, what they showed is that this operator is not always efficiently realizable. And this operator here on the right side, this in-place operator, is the crucial one for this Q and QCPA security notion we are considering. So let's look at, at this notion. So we have our quantum adversary and this quantum challenger. And in the notion, the adversary will send over two messages, M0 and M1, to the challenger. The challenger will flip a bit B at random, then discards one of the two message registers by the adversary. And then it applies this in-place operator here, so mapping from some randomness R chosen by the challenger and the message register MB into the randomness R and the encryption of the message MB under this particular randomness. So here the, the part with R, this is not to be confused with the X operator, but keeping R here is to explicitly de-randomize the operator whereas in, in the other notions, the randomness is often uh, implicit. And in fact, it turns out that this is actually important in order to ensure the reversibility of the operator. So after evaluating this operator, the challenger will then send the second register containing the ciphertext back to the adversary. One observation here, the randomness is generally assumed to be classical, hence it will be unentangled with the ciphertext register 
So it is fine that the challenger just withholds this randomness register. The core question we had in this work was, was then, can we actually efficiently build this operator? And this was shown for several uh, schemes. So the first construction is for so-called perfectly correct public encryption schemes, so schemes that do not suffer from decryption failures. So we start with the randomness and the message register. We can set up some auxiliary register with zero and then apply the XOR operator for encryption, which will then output the randomness and the message. And in the output register produces the ciphertext C. Can then flip the ciphertext and the message register and put them in as input into the XOR operator for decryption which will output us the ciphertext and on the output register will effectively XOR the message together with the decryption of the ciphertext. So this will uh, be zero. Now the dash box here corresponds to this in-place encryption operator that we need. This construction has two drawbacks. First, it requires, so it is an in-place encryption operator, but it already requires knowledge of the secret key as we're using this XOR operator for decryption. And also it does not work for schemes that suffer from decryption failures, as for these actually this uncomputing step marked here will not, not work. To circumvent with this, uh, there is uh, what we call recoverable public key encryption schemes. So we call here the, the setting for encryption schemes. We have the encryption algorithm which takes a message together with uh, the public key and some randomness and produce some ciphertext. And then for decryption, we just use the secret key to deterministically decrypt the ciphertext to the message M. And for recoverable schemes, there is an additional algorithm, the recover algorithm, that allows for decryption. And this one takes also the ciphertext, but instead of the secret key, we give it both the public key and the randomness. And it will then also output the message. So in a nutshell, recoverable public encryption schemes allow for decryption using the randomness. And it turns out that most public encryption schemes are indeed recoverable. So we can then also construct this in-place operator for recoverable public encryption schemes. So again, starting with the randomness and the message register, we also set up the auxiliary register and apply the X or operator for encryption, which will then give us randomness, message, and ciphertext. And now we run the uh, X operator for the recover algorithm, also flipping ciphertext and message, but also keeping the randomness as an input for this operator. And by construction, this will output us the randomness and the ciphertext, which were the inputs. And on the output register, it will X or the message together with the output of the recover algorithm on this ciphertext. So this will be zero. And here, again, the dashed box now corresponds to our in-place operator for the encryption algorithm. And with this, we have an in-place encryption operator that requires merely the public key as both the XOR operator for encryption and the X operator for the recover algorithm only require the public key. Now coming back to the <coughs> Q and QCPA security notion, um, when we consider the challenger here, this the, ch uh, the challenger models the encrypting party. And in the standard communication settings, so when Alice is communicating with Bob, we have the setting that whoever encrypts the message will only know the public key. But potentially there are other settings, for instance, for like public key based, uh, public encryption based commitment schemes, one can consider that the encrypting party holds both keys and then later opens uh, the key to the other party. So the main question we now ask, focusing on the standard communication setting, are there public key encryption schemes for which this Q and QCPA security notion cannot be defined if we restrict the challenger to only know the public key? So we can use the, the classification we have from previous works, which uh, divides this here based on the on the correctness of the schemes and the recoverable property. So we have um, yeah, the following picture here and everything in the in dark gray. This is for which we can define the security. And we know from the previous picture that for the recoverable schemes, we know that we can uh, realize the operator using only the public key. 
So the interesting part here, or what we are looking now for, are schemes that are non-recoverable. So the question is, are there schemes that are non-recoverable? And from previous works, we know that there ex exists a transformation that transforms schemes, recoverable schemes, into non-recoverable schemes. This is what we here call a trapdoor transformation. So it takes a public encryption scheme sigma and a trapdoor permutation pi. And for the key generation, it simply runs the, the key generation of the two underlying schemes. And then the two public keys from the underlying schemes form the public key of the transformed scheme, while the two secret keys form the, uh, the secret key of the transformed scheme. Then if we want to encrypt some message m under this transformed scheme, as the first step, we will first permute the message using the trapdoor permutation. So permuting the message m into some value y. And then afterwards run the encryption encryption scheme, the underlying encryption scheme sigma to encrypt y into some ciphertext c. And decryption then works in the obvious reversed way. So the first step is to use sigma in order to decrypt the ciphertext into y. And then afterwards, apply the inverse permutation to uh, recover the message m from the value y. So for this construction here, the trapdoor permutation essentially prevents the recoverability because in order to recover the message from the ciphertext, we need to somehow recover the message m from the value y. But on the other hand, it turns out that the trapdoor permutation does not affect security of this transformed scheme. So the security of this transformed scheme solely depends on the security uh, of the underlying encryption scheme. And in particular, what we should now show in this work is that we can easily transform this also into a recoverable PKE scheme. And the idea is fairly simple. So as said, the, the underlying trapdoor permutation does not contribute to the security. So we can come up with this different key generation algorithm where we also put the secret key of the underlying trapdoor permutation into the public key of the transformed scheme. And this will not affect security of the scheme. And what this allows us now is actually to decrypt, uh, to invert the, the permutation to get the message M by using just the public key. So now since the, the secret key SK pi is part of the public key, can easily recover the message M from the value Y, whereas before to recover Y from the ciphertext, this is something we can do just using the recoverable property of the underlying encryption scheme sigma. So this gives us a refined classification, where now, instead of just having this large box of the non-recoverable scheme, we also have this equivalent recoverable scheme. And this trapdoor permutation from prior work only gives transforms a scheme into these equivalent recoverable schemes, whereas this slightly different modification returns or re transforms them back into recoverable schemes. So this leaves the same question. We're still interested in these non-recoverable schemes. So the, the core question is, are there now non-recoverable public encryption schemes? And for this, we then look into the OAEP construction. So this, this construction transforms a trapdoor permutation into a public key encryption scheme. And here you can see how this looks like. So this is the only the CPA secure variant. So there's the CCA secure variant where the message is first padded, but for our case, uh, the CPA secure variant is su sufficient. So for this construction, we have the message and some randomness. And we do this two round Feistel construction with hash functions G and H, which will then give us values S and T. And then applying the trapdoor permutation F to S and T will give us the ciphertext C. Security for the OAP construction crucially depends on the function F. Namely, if F is partial domain one way, then the construction is secure, where this means this partial domain one minus means that given this value C, it should be hard to find this partial pre-image S. When considering the recoverability of OAEP, we show that assuming that F is partial domain one way, 
that the construction is not recoverable. And the core idea here is that knowledge of the randomness R does not help. And to see this, we can check. So the, the message M corresponds to the XOR of the value S together with G of R. And well, if we know the value R, we obviously can figure out G of R. But then to recover the message M, we still need to figure, the, figure out the value S, which means breaking this partial domain one witness of the trapdoor permutation F. On the other hand, we also show that uh, this partial domain was actually crucial because just assuming F is one way, meaning it should be infeasible to recover both S and T, that this is not enough to argue that the scheme is non-recoverable. So if we consider the following function F, for which, uh, which for values S and T does the following, just does the identity on the value S and then applies some other permutation, trapdoor permutation F star on T, then for this you can show that the scheme would be indeed recoverable, namely from this ciphertext C, you can easily recover the message S just taking the first half of it. And then from the value R, you can easily compute G of R, and then you have both the values you need to XOR in order to recover the message M. So with this, we've shown that the uh, OAP construction is non-recoverable. This means we can no longer use the, the previous construction based on the recoverable property, but this is not sufficient so far uh, to also rule out that we cannot uh, implement this in-place operator for the qint qcpa security notion. So what we do for this now is here we have the, the partial domain one minus security game. This is what I just described uh, in an informal way. So you generate some inputs S and T, you apply the function to get some value C, and then the adversary is asked to find this partial pre-image S. We then define a slightly different variant of this PD one way star. And here we give this adversary one additional value R, which corresponds to uh, H of S, X or T. And this is exactly fitting the, the setting of the OAP construction here. And what we show for this is hardness of, uh, of the partial domain one witness also implies hardness of this modified game where the adversary gets this extra hint R. And likewise here we get the, the same that this extra information of R doesn't really help the adversary unless it already, or for, to show this just uh, if it would help the, or, uh, the adversary already figured out the partial pre -image. With this we can then finally show that we cannot construct this in-place operator for the OAP construction that we would need for the Q and QCPA security notion. And to show this, we assume for sake of contradiction that the challenger could uh, come up with this in-place operator solely constructed from the public key and that this function achieves this variant of partial domain one witness security. So if the adversary can come up with this in-place operator, it can also find this inverse operator for this. And then if we plug in the inputs, so we get randomness and ciphertext and they would map it to randomness and ciphertext. And in between, we essentially also get the randomness and the message. And what we can do here then is to set up two auxiliary registers with zero, and then X or the two values between the in-place operators into these auxiliary registers. And then we basically do the, uh, the Feistel construction for the hash function G and H. And then the output here will be the values S and T. And so this as a whole gives us then an operator that base essentially breaks the, the partial domain one witness and thereby contradicting our assumption. And the, the core part here is if we assume that the, so all of this would only require the public key as by assumption, we assume the in-place operators only require the public key and G and H obviously do not require the secret key. And so with this, we show that the OAP construction, we cannot define the Q and QCPA security notion if we restrict the challenger to only know the public key. So let me wrap up and mention some open problems. So we focus on the applicability of the Q and QCPA security notion. And we did this for the setting where we restrict the challenger to only know the public key. For this, we showed that the OAP construction is non-recoverable. 
And then based on this, that the, the mandatory in-place operator for the security notion cannot be constructed from solely knowing the public key. So one open question would be, are there more non-recoverable public key encryption schemes uh, for which potentially also the notion is not applicable? And in general, as mentioned initially, we have several security notions. So another interesting question would be to come up with a unified quantum security notion for public key encryption schemes, essentially combining the, the approaches from the two previous works. And this concludes my presentation. Thank you very much.